right, welcome and, uh, to our 10 o'clock service and also uh, the, uh, the first uh, official week in a sense of our, our uh, Spring to Life. And uh, yesterday a lot of us were springing to life as we uh, did a lot of work uh, around the place and doesn't it look so much better for, for that? It's really good. And uh, it reminded me as I was thinking through really how coming together to work on a project like that actually is good for us as a community as well. It's not only good for our buildings and the, uh, and the things that we clean and tidy up, but it's, it's good for us together because we're actually working and serving together. Um, in Ephesians 4, it talks about using the gifts that we have, and it talks about being uh, the body of Christ and using the gifts that we have individually, and in a sense, some of the painting and the cleaning and so on. These seem to be quite menial things, but they're not really. They're actually a significant contribution that we can all make. So you might not see your gift as necessarily to clean or to paint, but it's something that, that, that we can do, and I think everything looks so much better for that. Uh, in Ephesians 4, it talks about the gifts of service from which the whole body and each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And let that be uh, an encouragement to us. Now, in the last few days, um, we've heard the sad news of the death of the Queen and uh, Loris is dressed this morning in purple for us and she's also got a, she's brought along a message, haven't you, Loris, that you received from the Queen. And... Um, I'm going to read um, the message that's gone out to the churches from the Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Raphael, uh, on the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, he said, the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth is a profound sadness, the depth of which is difficult to express. Anglicans in New South Wales join all Australians in mourning her passing. For most people, her reign and her godly example is all we have known. We have delighted in her visits to this nation and to our churches. She has been for many a tower of strength in times of adversity and a model of compassion, faith and selflessness in the service of humanity. But we do not grieve for those who are without hope. We give a heartfelt thanks uh, to God for her long reign and her remarkable dignity, grace and stinting unhumble service motivated by enduring Christian faith. And we offer our condolences and prayer to the royal family. Just also like to quote something that the Queen had in her message, in um, her Christmas message uh, for the year 2000. She reflected upon herself and her own belief. And she said, for me, the teaching of Christ and my own accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my own life. I, like so many others, have, been, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and examples. And uh, I think that can be an inspiration to us because that's not too long after her going through some really bad sort of issues or difficult issues uh, with her, her own family. And we're all going to to go through difficult times. Uh, the Queen and the Royal Family have been through theirs, but in those times she says that she drew upon the strength that she had in Jesus Christ. So in the passing of the Queen uh, this week, for most of us it's the only, the only King or Queen, that, the only Queen that we've known, we've now got a, a King, but it is a very significant event that the whole world recognises. It's not just a British thing, and I identify with that, of course. Um, but it is a thing that, that the whole world recognizes that here is a great leader who has seen 14 American presidents and 15 British prime ministers. What an incredible achievement. <coughs> well, after that sadness, but also, in a sense, the celebration of her, her life and recognition of that, we're now going to stand and we're going to, to sing what our hope is, and our hope, in, our hope is Christ in life and in death. So please stand now as we sing. <laughs>
song we've got four beautiful girls to come up and do some action <coughs> so if you girls want to come up the front in my wrestling and in my doubts in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled seas whoa you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, You are the peace in my troubled sea Love will lead me through. You are the peace in my trouble. See you. Oh.
Well, welcome to church today. My name is John. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm here for our family spot. Uh, and for this family spot, um, we'll need just the next slide, please. Greg, there we go. It's our family spot. Uh, I'm going to see how good your memories are after something we did a few weeks ago. Now, if you weren't here a few weeks ago, that's okay, because it should be something that you already know. And that is the books of the New Testament. We're going to sing a song, but you can stay sitting down for this song. Uh, and this is actually by special request. Someone said, we should do that again and see how they've remembered it, see whether it's helped them learn the order of books in the New Testament. And you might think, oh, that, I don't need to know that. But when you're working your way around your Bible, when you're reading things or talking with people, it's actually really helpful when you open up the New Testament to know, oh, I'm actually trying to go this way or that way. And it just really helps us understand God's word if we actually know our way around it. So uh, this is a fun way of learning the order of the books of the New Testament. It's to a very familiar tune, Waltzing Matilda. Uh, and we'll sing it. It actually goes through twice in the song. And don't worry, it's not very long because, you know, it's not the Old Testament. One, two, three. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts and Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, then Peter 1 and 2 one, two, and three, John, Jude, and Revelation. The books of the New Testament are through. Uh, la, 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 la. Well, I think we should do them again, just for practice. Here we go. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. One and two, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. One and two, Thessalonians. One and two, Timothy, and Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, then what? Peter, one and two. One, two and three, John, Jude, and what? Come on. Revelation. The books of the New Testament are through. Hey! Well, we're going to do some more singing now. Uh, please stand, and we're going to have our uh, third song, which is No Other Name. Joy and sorrow, tears, my 
song does remind us that there's no other name but Jesus, right? And so many of us have known that change in our lives of not knowing Jesus and then coming to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing how that changes the way that we live and the way that we regard the world in, in which we live. Um, in our Bible studies, we're encouraged at the moment to write our own faith story and to, and to share that with others. For some it can be a dramatic change, for some it can be a gradual thing, having been brought into a Christian home and gradually growing into Christ. And um, the Bible study group that I'm go going to um, didn't meet last week, but what we're doing, we're actually going to send, the idea is to send a copy to each other of, of the things that we write down. And I think it's really important for us to do that, because when we write it down, it, it helps us to clarify our thoughts so that when we talk to other people and they ask us questions, we can not only answer the difficult questions which Steve was talking to us about last week, but we can talk about the personal things of knowing Jesus and the change that that uh, makes in, in our lives. Now this morning we're going to have um, a faith story too. Um, someone um, very well known to me uh, is going to uh, come and just present another part of a faith story that... Uh, I shared a few weeks ago, uh, very briefly, um, how I was challenged to, to, to think uh, about uh, the claims of Jesus Christ as a person rather than the, the tradition that I had, which was as a Catholic, as a, more an institutional belief in Jesus. So Barbara is going to talk this morning about her faith journey. Uh, thank you. I know I'm on, amongst friends, I think. <laughs> um, as David mentioned, um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago and just now um, about his own faith journey and how it started. Now, I wasn't there at that time. I was overseas with our daughter Michelle visiting family in the UK. So I really didn't know what was happening back at home in Australia. And when I came back from overseas, I found that David had developed some rather strange habits. <laughs> um, he was going to church, and he was reading his Bible. Now, we'd always had a Bible in our house, but it was not something that we actually read. <laughs> um, so after I'd been home a little while, David tried to share with me what had happened in, in his life, but I really wasn't very interested. But I did notice, as time went on, I did notice a change in his life. So we went along like this, with two different lives in some ways, and then about a year later, uh, something quite traumatic happened in our lives, and that is that our second child, uh, a boy, was born suddenly, very prematurely. And this just threw our world into complete turmoil. And I remember feeling really alone and ho helpless. It was just a very difficult time. 
And two things happened at that time. <coughs> um, the church, when David and Michelle went to church on the Sunday and told them what had happened, some people asked him for lunch and looked after them in the afternoon and they had a great time. And the second thing was, a couple of days later, when I came home from hospital, the minister at his church heard he wasn't at work and called the hospital to see what had happened. So anyway, after a few weeks, Daniel came home from hospital and uh, he's perfectly healthy and well. After, we, after I'd been home from hospital a few days, the minister came to see us. And we sat in our lounge room and we chatted. And then suddenly, Michelle and David had to go. They went and did something. And suddenly, I was on my own with this minister, <laughs> which I hardly knew. And it was a bit awkward. <laughs> um, but basically, he said, to, he said to me, look, I know, I know David's a Christian, but where do you stand? And well, I didn't really stand anywhere at that point. But he encouraged me to read John's Gospel. And so what happened is I'd read some of John's Gospel, and he used to come each week, and we used to talk about it. And we used to, uh, I asked questions and so on. But then, of course, you know, in the midst of all this, David and I were building a new house, and in the midst of all this, we moved to another parish and so David left that church and went to another church so <clears throat> we, we weren't having any contact with them at that point um, so I'd come to the point where I understood what the Bible was saying I had read it for the first time but it was a head knowledge only and that's where I was and I was a bit stuck in that sort of limbo world then one Friday afternoon <laughs> When both kids were asleep, there was a knock on the door, and the minister from this previous parish just arrived, completely unannounced. And we sat at our breakfast bar in our old house, and we talked, and he encouraged me to make a commitment. And that's what I did. At that moment, in my kitchen, I asked the Lord to come into my life. And it was the most wondrously joyful thing and I understood at that moment that even though I was totally and utterly undeserving that Christ loved me that he died for me paid the price for all my wrongdoings and that he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for me so as you probably realize that event took, took a place a few years ago <laughs> and since then, um, my, our lives, my life, like everyone else's, has had its ups, its downs, its highs, and its great difficulties. But now I can say that the Lord has been with me through that and has had people around me to support and help me on that journey with him. And I'll just share this verse with you. Um, I have a book which is a, like a diary where I write sermon notes <laughs> and uh, prayer points and verses from the Bible that I've been reading. But, so I have one each year and at the beginning I put a verse at the beginning for, for me. And the, what my verse, this is my verse for this year, Hebrews 10, 23, uh, with a slight change of pronoun. Lord, let me hold unswerving to the hope I profess for he, Christ, who promised, is faithful, and indeed he is. Thank you. Well, Barbara's family, isn't she? But in a sense, as Christians, we're all family, uh, because we are all part of the same spirit, that, that we receive the, whole, the same Holy Spirit that changes our lives and brings us into, not only union with Christ, but also into, into union with each other. Uh, we're going to now have our two uh, Bible readings from, from Beth, and that will be followed by Paul. Um, the first Bible reading you'll be very familiar with, um, it's from the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 1 to 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The second reading is uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, uh, starting at verse 1 and going down to verse 21. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sh his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will, turn, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came, to me, came before me sorry, were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? For those of you who don't know me, my name's Steve Lason. I'm part of the mystery team here at Jeringong Anglican. It's great to have you here. If you're a visitor here today, it's especially wonderful to have you here. Uh, we hope you enjoy the service and hope you're able to stay behind after the service for a cup of tea. Um, we'll be out sharing a morning, some morning tea together. Today we're starting a, uh, just a short period of time where, as a church, we're going to be telling people about Jesus. Uh, we're calling it Spring to Life because we figure it's, it's springtime and things are starting to, uh, to come to life. Uh, the garden is, and well, when, when it's not pouring with rain, uh, and the grass is starting to grow and the flowers are starting to come out. And you may have noticed the amazing decorations that have been put up behind me. Um, and, we, and this time is all about life coming back, I guess, to our, to our area, to our, to our world. And so we want to think about how we can bring life 
uh, the eternal life to our world. And so that's why we're thinking about spring to life. But I'm going to actually ask God to be with us as we look at these, vers- these verses for a, for a little while. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here like this. We thank you that you've promised that whenever we gather together, you're here with us. Uh, and Lord, we ask that you be with us today as we uh, look a little bit more at Jesus. Help us to understand him a little bit better. Help us to know who he is and how we should respond to him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if you could achieve anything in your life. For some of you, as I look around, have, have achieved some amazing things in your life, and I don't want to try, get you to list them. Um, but uh, if, you, if you could pick anything that you haven't done, that you'd like to do, or you wish you had done, I wonder what it would be. What would be something that you really would love to have done? Uh, for me, um, sport and, to, and music are two big things in my life. And so one of the things I would have loved to have done is to win a world championship in something, preferably football, the real football, the round football. Um, but uh, any, anything really, I'd be happy to have, um, to have been successful as. You know, I think just as a kid, I remember watching them at the FA Cup at you know, some ridiculous hour in the night and seeing the person come there and just lift up the cup and the whole crowd, go, well, half the crowd, go completely mad um, and, and be really excited. Uh, I would have loved to have done that. It'd be, it'd have been awesome. Um, but but also music is something I really love. I love playing guitar, and I, I would have loved to have been a, a singer in a band or just part of a famous band. I just imagine travelling around the world and uh, yeah, getting on your private jet and going off to the next country and setting things up and the lights and the, the, the smoke machines. It would have been fantastic. Um, <laughs> you, know, you could have come. It would have been fine. Um, well, what would your thing have been? I just think it would be really amazing to have achieved some of those things, to, to be really, uh, to have really done something big. The problem is, when I think about those things, and I, and I, I listen to those who've, who've actually done them, when I listen to them speak, I wonder if maybe they're not all that they're cracked up to be. So, for instance, I'm not a fan of gridiron, but I, I, I imagine it's, I, I understand it's pretty big in America, that they call it American football. Um, one of the most famous quarterbacks of all time is a guy by the name of Tom Brady. This year, he's starting his 23rd year as a starting quarterback. How incredible is that? 23 years in, in, in there. It's incredible. Um, but a couple of years back, he was interviewed uh, for TV, and this is what he said. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, I've reached my goal, my dream, my life. But me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be all it's cracked up to be. This guy has achieved everything in, in his, his chosen field, and yet there's, there's an emptiness there. Maybe sport isn't all I thought it was. Well, what about singing? Well, you know, one of the, as I grew up, there, uh, there was somebody who was quite famous who I really loved, and you may have heard of him. He's got, he's got the name of Elvis. Um, I was not uh, alive when he was, you know, a star, but um, I really lo- I like looking back at his music because I'm so young. Um, but uh, and he was incredibly famous, one of the most popular singers of all time. But six <laughs> weeks before he died, again he was interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter said to him, "Elvis, when you started playing music, you said you wanted to be rich, famous, and happy. <clears throat> well, you're certainly rich and famous, but are you happy?" And Elvis' response was, "No, I'm as lonely as hell." Um, terrible, isn't it? And he's not alone, of course, as you look through um, the years, the, uh, the ages of, of music. Um, quite often, people at the very height of their powers, the height of their fame, take their own life because they see there's a real emptiness there. So maybe music and sport aren't all I thought they were. Well, maybe world domination is more your, your speed. If that's you, then you might want to consider Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered not just one country like Vladimir, um, but or who is struggling, isn't he? Um, but he actually conquered the whole known world at his time, of his time, and by the age of thirty. So if you are over thirty and you haven't conquered the world, you're really falling behind. I'd say, yeah, um, incredible. But having done so, the story is told that he went to his tent and he wept because he said, "There are no more worlds to conquer." He'd achieved all of that, and even that wasn't enough. It seems so often that people, they go out, they set out, they set a goal, and they aim to achieve these things, and when they get there, they realise, well, it's just, it, it doesn't satisfy them. And my hunch is, and I don't think I'm, I'm too far off the, the base, is that 
I reckon there are plenty of ordinary people, people like you and me, um, who do ordinary things who feel pretty similar. And we can even feel that way in the midst of a very happy life, a successful career, beautiful South Coast living. Uh, these feelings can still hit us. Certainly we've, we see that in our, in our town over recent years as people who have actually taken their own life because they realise they've got all these things but it still doesn't satisfy. Now, of course, life is not always like this. Sometimes life is really great. We're just going along and everything's fantastic. It's like you're riding a wave that just keeps going and going. And if your life is like that, that's great. I want to say congratulations. That's fantastic. And I don't want to rain your parade. I want to you encourage you to enjoy the, the life that God has given to you. However, um, it's a little bit like this, that an ad, ad that aired a few years back. That, I don't know if you remember it. It was for income protection insurance, which sounds really fun. Um, but in, in this ad, there's a husband sitting there uh, on the couch and he's watching YouTube videos of an elephant playing uh, harmonica. Uh, you can actually find these videos. I've looked them up. They're quite funny. Uh, but anyway, and he's enjoying this video. And his wife, uh, she's always sensible. It's always the women who are sensible. I'm not sure why that is. But anyway, um, she comes over to him. She's been reading a leaflet on insurance. Um, and so she comes over to him and says, I wonder, have you ever thought, what would you, we do if you couldn't work anymore? And he thinks about it for a moment and then he goes back to his videos because he just doesn't want to think about it. He's, he much prefer to kind of just enjoy the thing that's right in front of him. But she says, no, no, no. And she interrupts him again and says, no, this is serious. We really need to think about this. Now, as I said, if your life is going great just now, if you're seeing um, YouTube videos about elephants playing harmonicas everywhere in your life, that's great. Um, but I want to suggest to you that this is serious, that life may not always be as wonderful as it is right now. In fact, there are probably people here today or people who are watching online um, who are going through difficulty in life. Or perhaps uh, you're at this point in your life where you go, well, I've got all these things or I've done all these things, but there still seems to be something missing. That's what I want to think about today, and that's what we're thinking about for the next two weeks as we look at uh, this, this whole spring to life thing. We want to help people to see that life can actually spring from within them uh, in a way that gives them lasting joy and satisfaction. And so what, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the person of Jesus, because in the end, as Christians, we're all about Jesus. We're not about the church, we're not about the Anglican church, it's, they're all very well, but what we're really about is Jesus. And so we want to introduce people to him. And if you've never met him, or you don't know anything about him, I hope you find this helpful. So Jesus uh, lived a couple of thousand years ago in a place called uh, Israel, um, a real place in real time. And uh, he, as he walked the streets of uh, Galilee and Judea, which is the south of, of Israel, um, he said and did amazing things. And one of the things, he talked a lot about eternity, but he also talked about life in the here and now. And he made some pretty audacious promises. So in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In other words, if you want to know the right way to live your life, you need to come to me. Now, I don't know if you ever feel that one way. It usually happens when you've got small children. Life just seems to happen to you. And you kind of bumble through from one thing to the next. And sometimes you kind of don't know where you're going or what you're doing. Uh, but Jesus is saying, no matter where you are in life or what you're doing, I am, the one, I am the light. I will show you the way. In fact, later on, a couple of chapters later, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. He actually says, you need to come to me if you want to know what life is all about and where life is going. Back in John chapter 6, a couple of verses, chapters earlier, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, of course, he's not saying he's really bread. It's a metaphor to describe the fact that He's the one who can truly satisfy you. That he can give you the things that, that will keep you going, sustain you in your life and give you um, true satisfaction. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, another description of Jesus' life, uh, he says to people who are struggling in their life, he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In other words, if in, if in your life you're, you're going through difficulty and pain, uh, he says, come to me. And I will, I will heal that pain. I will carry you through that difficulty. And today, in today's passage that we had read from John chapter 11, he's at it again. He says, I am the good shepherd. Now, it's not because Jesus is a shepherd, let alone a good one. He's actually a carpenter. Uh, but he says, I'm a good, I am the good shepherd. What does he mean? Well, he's actually, again, he's using a metaphor 
trying to describe the way he relates to, to his people. Right? Um, he's describing us as sheep, which I don't want you to be offended by. We'll get back to that in a minute. But he talks about himself as a good shepherd. Well, what does a good shepherd do? Well, it seems to me a good shepherd does two things. Um, firstly, they need to provide for their sheep. And so they need to make sure they've got something to eat, whether it's fresh grass or grain or whatever it might be. Um, he needs to provide for the sheep. And secondly, he needs to protect the sheep. Sheep are not the most ferocious animals in the world, uh, and they're pretty, uh, they're pretty on their own. And so if there's anything that's going to come at them, they've got Buckleys, right? So um, the, the shepherd, one of the roles of the shepherd is to protect them from the ferocious animals. And Jesus, I think Jesus says that he is the good shepherd because he does both of those things. And so I just want to think about those two things. How does Jesus provide for the sheep and how does he protect them? So how does he provide for them? Well, firstly, um, the first thing is it has to do with this idea of satisfaction, I think, one of the, one of the ways. The Bible tells us that uh, God made us and he loves us and he made us for a relationship with him. However, so many people in our world actually totally ignore God. They reject him out of hand. They don't, they want, they don't want to have anything to do with him. And as a result, I think there are a lot of people who live their life with this kind of emptiness inside them. or this, they're, they're looking for something to, to, uh, uh, to complete them. Uh, and they use, use all sorts of things to try and do that. So it might be sport, it might be work, or it, might, uh, it might be music, or it might, might be work, or it might be overseas holidays, or it might be sex or drugs or alcohol or whatever it might be. We search for things and we try to fill our lives to, to, to make ourselves feel good. But sadly, as we saw before, sometimes those things just don't satisfy. Because in the end, we were designed to fill that emptiness with a relationship with God. And anything else is always going to come up short. He will never fill us up. These things that we, that we chase after just will never cut it. And if, and if COVID's taught us anything, it's that all these things that we do rely on, we, th we think, well, these things are secure, at least I've got that. Well, all those things can be taken away, can't they? Uh, whether it's family relationships or uh, whether it's health or jobs or, or whatever it might be, financial security, these things can so easily be taken away. But in the midst of that, Jesus says in um, chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, that you might be filled up, that emptiness inside you might be filled up. I think some people see the Christian life as a series of thou shalt nots. Basically, God's just looked at, the, at people living and he thought, well, this person, this person, you can have fun in this way, this way, and this way. And so I can say, thou shalt not do that or that or that. Right? That's, I think a lot of people see the Christian as like, life as like that. It's a whole bunch of rules that stop us from having fun, that um, stop us from having a satisfying life. Um, that's why, and you know, sometimes Christians don't help with that. Sometimes we're a bit boring, aren't we? Um, and I know I am. But anyway, the rest of you are fun. But... Um, but the true faith in Jesus, couldn't, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, Jesus comes to, get, to fill our lives in a way that the worldly things just cannot. He comes to give us true peace, true contentment, true purpose in life, to give us life to the full. And not just, life, not just for this life, but life that goes on forever. Jesus says, if you come to me, I can give you eternal life. That, and all of the pain, all the suffering that we see will be gone. He promises to bring us quantity and quality of life that's what jesus come to do and of course it's not just a nice fairy story that ministers like me like to stand up and, and talk about say look if you believe in god all these things, all your problems will fade away and everything will be fantastic um, but i would encourage you to if you, this is your first time here today uh, maybe somebody's brought you it's great as i said it's great to have you here Maybe to ask the person who brought you. Come and uh, talk to Barbara. Well, how great it was to hear from Barbara. Um, and and that, that, that experience for her is actually a common experience for Christians. That as, a, as we accept, allow Jesus into our life, it actually does fill us up. And it doesn't mean that life is always going to be like a bed of roses, unless you realise that roses also have th thorns. Because, because uh, life is difficult sometimes, and Christians go through difficult times, just like everyone else. But one of the joys and one of the blessings of the Christian's life is that Jesus is always with us. And he can give us hope even when it seem, life seems hopeless. He can give us joy even in the midst of great sadness. And that's what that, uh, that list from Matthew chapter 5 was about, uh, where Jesus is talking about those who come to me. He says, blessed are those uh, who come to me. 
And he lists all these amazing things. Uh, comfort for the morning, satisfaction for the hungry, hungry, blessing to the humble, so much more. Jesus comes, promises to give all of these amazing blessings. Which, of course, is one of the most impressive things for me about the Queen. David mentioned he stole my, my quote, but I'm going to read to you again. Because um, his quote, uh, uh, the, this quote from, uh, from her uh, Christmas message, says a lot about who she is and, and what, she, what her life was like. Her life was, you know, she's queen, right? She's got everything she could possibly ever want. Um, and yet, her life was difficult at times, wasn't it? Mostly brought on by her own family, doing outrageous things. But, uh, but life was hard for her, at, just as it is for us. She experiences the same kind of pains and sadness. And that quote that David quoted, I'll read to you again because it's really helpful. She says, For me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. I, like so many of you, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and examples. The, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, was at her core a woman of faith. And in the midst of those difficulties, in the midst of those trials, she didn't rely on her popularity or fame or her position of power. She relied on a relationship with Jesus. That was the thing that sustained her. And that is just the thing, thing that can sustain you. Because this is actually for all people. And Jesus talks about calling his sheep to him. And he might, want to, he might be calling you today to actually come to him. That you might receive this amazing blessing from him. Jesus comes to give us life and life to the full. Um, to give us the peace, the contentment, the joy that we really, really need. To fill our cups. But how do we know that Jesus actually would do that. How do we know? Well, one way we know is by talking to people and seeing the experience, uh, and it's great to hear that. But how can we know that Jesus hasn't got some kind of other agenda? Because we're used to, aren't we, people in positions of power having other agendas. Um, they're out for you know, the, the travel rorts or you know, the big pensions or whatever it might be. Sometimes we know the people who are in power, although they might do some good things, they're, they're really kind of they're snouts in the trough and they're, try, they're trying out for themselves. How do we know that Jesus isn't like that? Well, we know Jesus isn't like that because the second thing he does, not only does he provide for us at the deepest level of our needs, he also protects his sheep. He protects us. How does he do that? Well, in verse 11, he tells us, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. How far will Jesus go to protect you and me? He will give his own life. That's how we know that Jesus isn't in it for himself he does, when the opportunity comes for Jesus to be put up on a, on a pedestal and for people to, to actually bow down and worship him, he actually w walks away. He actually doesn't want that from, a, from the people he's talking to. He doesn't want to be made a king in that way. He already is a king. He's actually come to give his life. Uh, you may have heard of Jesus dying on a cross. That's we what we celebrate at Easter. That's what it's all about. It's about Jesus giving his life to restore us. The, uh, one of the writers of the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Isaiah, puts it this way. He says, We are all like sheep, and we have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him, talking about Jesus, laid on him the sin of us all. You see, as I said earlier, God made us for this relationship with him. That when we turn away from him, it leaves an emptiness, a hole inside us. But we can't fix that relationship because we've, we've rejected him. We've said, no, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And we cannot fix that relationship ourselves. But when Jesus comes and experiences our life and lives and dies on a cross for us and raises, rises to life, he actually opens the door again. He welcomes us in to that relationship with him. And that's what the Christian faith is really all about. It's all about Jesus dying so that we can be back in a relationship with God. He saves us, not from COVID-19, like Jesus is not our vaccine, right? Um, Jesus doesn't save us from all the difficulties in life. We'll go through those difficulties. But no matter what we go through, Jesus will rescue us from our ultimate enemy, death, separation from God. Jesus actually brings us back into a relationship with God so that even when we die, we will live with him. And that's why we have this great um, confidence about the Queen, don't we? Because we know that she has this relationship with Jesus and she is now with him. 
This restored relationship is the thing that will give us this peace, that will fill our emptiness. Jesus' rescue brings us back. And so that's what we're about for the next two weeks. And so if you're here for the first time, uh, or you're hearing for this first time, or the first time for a long time, um, I want to encourage you to, 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 to explore this idea. I don't expect that today, because I've spoken to you for 15 minutes or so, um, that you will just jump out and uh, come, want to become a Christian. Um, if you want to, that's fantastic and that's, that's great. Um, but I want to encourage you to think it over the next couple of weeks and just start exploring. Do you feel that your life is full of satisfaction? Are you completely satisfied with your life? Or do you feel that maybe there's something more? That maybe there's more to life than what I can see and touch? Um, I want to encourage you over the next couple of weeks to actually to explore whether Jesus actually can and does do what I've been saying. When he can actually completely satisfy you and he can rescue you. That's what we're going to be looking at. And I want to encourage you, uh, if you haven't ever done so before, to maybe start reading the stories of Jesus' life. Uh, we've got some copies of a book called The, Esse- the Essential Jesus. It's, called, it's the title of it. But it's basically the book of Luke, it's, which is just one of the, the writers from the first century writing about Jesus, the, the Jesus he saw or he heard about, and, he, and that, was, that was written down. Um, Luke describes Jesus' life for us. If you want to check him out for yourself... I said earlier that Jesus uh, is the good shepherd and he's talking about us as the sheep. Not because he thinks that we're dim or that we should just follow him you know, wherever he goes, um, but actually just because that we are precious to him and that we need him like a sheep needs a shepherd. Uh, and what, what he actually does encourage us to do is to explore and to, he calls us um, to, to find out about him. And I want to encourage you to do that. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the fact that Jesus brings meaning to our lives, that Jesus actually can bring us hope. Um, and uh, different activities during the, over the, the fortnight are going to be looking at different aspects of who Jesus is and what he brings to us. And then after the, the two weeks are over, we're going to continue to, to look, explore these ideas about what Jesus brings. And so we're going to be thinking at some of the big questions that people have um, about the Christian faith. So we're going to be thinking about suffering. We're going to be thinking about science. We're going to be thinking about whether you can trust the Bible. And what is it, how, do we, how does it fit in with all these other faiths that are around? Um, so I want to encourage you over the coming weeks to explore these things. Come and talk to myself, come talk to John, uh, or t- as I say, talk to the person who, uh, who brought you. You might like to ask them their story. Barbara shared, shared her story. It takes a lot of guts to stand up and share your story in front of a whole church. So thank you, Barbara, for doing that. Um, but everyone here has a story about how Jesus, what Jesus has done for them. And I want to encourage you to do that. So I'm going to pray that God would help us to see Jesus for who he really is and that he would actually give us what he promises, life and life to the full. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that, he, that you sent him to, be, to live amongst us, uh, not just as a fact-finding mission, but to save us. Thank you that he came and he promised to give us life to the full, life in this life and life that goes into eternity, life with all the pain and suffering taken away. But Lord, we thank you that even in this life we, we can experience uh, that amazing joy of having Jesus with us, that he can fulfil us and satisfy us. And so we pray that you would help us to, to explore him in the coming days. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would reveal yourself to each one of us, particularly those, those who, are, who are exploring for the past for the first time. And Lord Jesus, as they do that, we pray that you would rescue them, that you would res- as you have rescued many of us here and brought us into this relationship with you, Lord, we pray that you would open that door for each one of us that we might walk in and and be renewed in our relationship with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, Steve. You know, one of the uh, the great privileges that we have as Christians is, is prayer. Because when we pray, we know that God hears our prayers and always responds to them, not necessarily in the way that we expect. So we're now going to have a, a collective time of prayer, and uh, Greg's going, going to lead us in that. Thank you, Greg. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are the sheep of your pasture, pasture, a motley, scruffy herd, but together we praise you for the truth in your word. You open the gate of your life-giving plan through Jesus, your son, God's one and only man, who removed the barriers between ourselves and you. Grant us the courage to remain faithful and true. You are the good shepherd and to you we must run. 
for you laid down your life on the cross. You then won a victory for humanity, calling all nations back home, from the Congo to China, from Somalia to Rome. While we don't see your plans very clearly, we admit we trust in your sovereignty and in prayer we don't quit. Please act in a way to show your love in real action and grant peace in the countries that need your compassion for the disabled, the displaced, traumatised, for those suffering so much. Reach out in action through NGOs, bring your touch. For asylum seekers and refugees in this place, bring resolution and hope. Please show your grace. Give us soft hearts. Show, your, show, show us how to respond, to love and reach out, to support, correspond. And to those who create such misery and war, please confound their plans, keep closing the door on all that they wish for, and all that's wrong, bring justice to those, Lord, don't wait so long. And for our brothers and sisters serving you overseas, we pray for your blessings and their stresses, please ease. For Simon and Jess Cowell in Italy where they live, bless the GBU group as they minister and give, bless the planning for next year, the ideas that they think through as they share their lives freely, longing others to know you. Encourage the two student leaders to help them stand, that both would continue to put their lives in your hand. And for Andrew and Beck and their time in the East, help them learn the language which can be such a beast. Open their eyes for opportunities to appropriately share. Give them wisdom about visas, and as for their family, you care. For the Damons in Mudgee, give them wisdom and strength that people would be keen to explore the Bible at length. Raise up scripture teachers and grant them good health. Bring people into fellowship and to grow spiritual wealth. And encourage our brother Wiki. In Kayama High School, grant him inspiration as his spirit you fuel. May parents enroll their children for scripture and grow the ICF group, you know the true picture. Some say they don't need you. Some unsure of the truth. Others questioning the ideas they heard in their youth. Some people for sure go with the tide, a journey of sorts, a directionless ride. Should they follow Jesus or let someone else be their armour, like Muhammad? Joseph Smith, or even the Dalai Lama. But none of these leaders rose up from the dead except Jesus the Nazarene, his true message now shed. I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is not dead. Dear Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right, both near and afar. On earth as in heaven, may your kingdom come down. Give us your bread every day before our smiles turn to frowns. Forgive us our wrongs as we forgive others today. Keep us from temptation, help us not to stray. For yours is the kingdom, the glory and the power. Please watch over today, hour by hour. Amen. Hi again. Um, just a couple of, we've always come to the end of our service, but just a couple of quick items of news. And they're basically all about um, the next two weeks about our mission. Uh, and so uh, we've got a lot of different activities. This week is a little bit quieter, but next week things uh, come at a, at a rush. And so just to, to remind you about things that are happening. Uh, the first one is that uh, is this Friday uh, is the progressive dinner. So please be praying for the youth as they, as they wander around our streets for safety and that kind of thing. Uh, and that God would speak to them as, and, as they bring their friends along. Um, next Sunday is the family picnic. Now, do any of our family picnic organisers want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? Not really? Um, is everything kind of sorted? You hope so, yes. So, yeah. So, pray for good weather, yes, absolutely. And we're still, I think we're still looking for picnic rugs, perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, but there are a few things, and there, there will be emails around if there's any, any great need. But it'd be really excellent to have people from this congregation, particularly, 
to be able to help serve at that, uh, on that day because we're hoping that, that lots of young families will come uh, and it's a way of connecting them to the people that they'd meet on a Sunday morning. So uh, if you're available next Sunday afternoon, please come and help out in some way. That would be really fantastic. Uh, so that's next Sunday. And then other things in the, in the week after, uh, the, the men's event uh, is on the Wednesday night. It's, it's a, a beer tasting and brewery tour down at the Stoic Brewery. Um, and so if you haven't got one already, there's a whole pile of invitations at the back uh, called Good News and Good Brews. And so it's going to be a fantastic evening. Um, there's actually a clipboard at the back that uh, we want to encourage guys for all of you to come, um, but if possible to bring someone with you. And so on that clipboard, uh, if you could write your name if you're intending to come, but also jot down if there's some, how many people you think you might be bringing, because we, uh, we obviously need to, uh, to provide for the people who come. So um, I hope you're able to come to that. So that's on Wednesday the 21st uh, down at the Stoic. Stoic. If you want to find out more about that, come and talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, the next day, the, the 22nd, um, the, uh, there's a seniors picnic on um, down at uh, Boat Harbour. And so if you self-describe, or perhaps you, if maybe if your children would describe you as a senior, um, you're, you're invited to come uh, and join us for that. It'll be a really great time. It's a BYA picnic, but uh, there'll be uh, kind of outdoor games and stuff to play and, and just and some good, uh, good fellowship and good fun together. So uh, please come and join us for that. It's the 22nd. And then on the Saturday, the 24th, uh, there's something else happening. What's happening then? The fashion parade, that's right. There's a ladies' fashion parade, which will be happening outside uh, on the grass out there. So please uh, come along to that. Uh, bring friends along to that. There's a fantastic speaker. There's even more fantastic models um, <laughs> who are taking part in it. It's going to be a really great, over a great day. So uh, come along uh, to, that, to that one. Uh, and then, uh, of course, our Sunday services are going to be on as usual. So lots of amazing things to be, to be praying for, to giving thanks to God for, uh, en encouraging people to get involved in different things. I did want to say a, huge, a couple of huge thank yous. One big thank you to the people who are responsible for our decorations. Um, awesome. <laughs> We're so appreciative of all that work that they've done. Um, so the, the three ladies, is Eile and Sarah and Jen. Um, were the main ones. Is anyone else I'm missing on that? Elena, yeah. Um, Elena as well. So, so thank you to those people. Um, but also I want to say thank you to, this, to the people who came to the Working Bee. Uh, I was speaking to Don this morning and you know, yesterday we had a, a bunch of people turn up to do some work around the place, um, putting up new lights and uh, doing some painting of the fence and all that kind of stuff. I want you to have a quick guess, see if you can guess how many people were involved either yesterday or in the days because some people couldn't make it yesterday but they came earlier um, during the week have a little guess about how many people were involved 61. Oh, boo <laughs> you've ruined it there was 61 people thank you daryl there were 61 people from our church um and daryl counted them i know so isn't that amazing is that fantastic to have so many people uh, from across our three congregations coming and serving. It's really awesome. So thank you so much. Um, there's still other stuff to be done. So there's second coats of paint that need to be done later on. But it's really awesome. Um, so thank you so much to all those people. Um, that's, oh, the second last thing. The last thing is um, I was speaking to Val Cuspertson this morning and she said um, if you're interested in helping out at Ukraine, you know what's been happening in Ukraine recently, um, there's actually a real need for a desperate need for Bibles in Ukraine at the moment. And so if you go to the Bible Society website, there's information there about how to provide Bibles for the people of Ukraine. So that's a, a practical way that we can help. Gina. Right. Well, as the uh, musicians are coming up, you remember the, the gardening show that uh, used to be taken by a man called Peter Cullen? Do you remember how he finished? He'd say, and that's your blooming lot. <laughs> um, and it seems very appropriate for spring, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it has been a great service. It has been a great opportunity to, uh, to come together, to encourage each other and to uh, hear from God's word. We're going to finish now uh, singing uh, the goodness of Jesus. And at the end of that, um, we'd encourage everybody to stay behind um, to uh, join us uh, for fellowship over uh, morning tea. So uh, stand now, please. The goodness of Jesus. Thank you.